What's up, Tribe? Welcome to the show. I'm excited about this week. We've got an incredible guest who we're going to talk about here in a moment. Just a reminder to all of you, of course, if you're interested in being part of this amazing community, go to GoBundance.com, fill out an application, and we'll make sure you go to the right level of tribe. If you're a millionaire or not, we've got a spot for you, so love that. Today's guest, Rob Rosell, is a GoBundance member. He's an entrepreneur. He's an investor. He's also an author of the book, Addicted to Life, uh, How I Went from Homeless to Extraordinary Success and Happiness in a Short Period of Time. He's an extremely inspiring man, and you're going to get a ton out of this episode. Rob, man, welcome. Thanks for doing this. Hey, thanks for having me, Jamie. I'm humbled by your introduction, but thank you for the kind words, brother. Oh, please, please. Every time, every time you open your mouth, more wisdom. I got paper and pen ready. <laughs> awesome. Ready to go. Pumped and ready to go. <laughs> I want, we're going to go into your backstory in a moment here, but I want to, I want to just sort of level set now. So uh, you're in the auto repair industry. You exit you're in the investment uh, space. Can you just kind of like, without getting into the the how you, you know, the beginnings of that, because we'll talk about how you got into the auto repair industry and everything in a moment, but just give for the, for, for me, for everybody listening, just sort of level set. What do you do and how, how do you do it? How are you an apartment investor today? What, what, what created that for you? You bet. So I slowly, but surely I graduated to five auto repair shops. We were bumper to bumper auto repair, all makes, all models, tires, brakes, uh, fluid flushes, you name it. We did it. Keeping your car on the road. And, um, in 2020, in September of 2020, I had just purchased my fifth location. I was in the process of scaling our companies uh, because in our industry, every industry has their little niche. In our industry, $10 million in gross sales is the magic number. So, and I was roughly at about 8.5 with the addition of our fifth store a couple of weeks prior to this. I thought I could get to that 10 million and that would have been my exit number. And what happens at that magic number is your multiple of EBITDA automatically goes from somewhere in the ballpark, you know, uh, you know, eight and a half million or eight million to 10 million, you would have went from a four multiple to a seven multiple. I mean, it jumped oh, wow. significantly. That's so cool. we were in the process of trying to scale to that level. And I was in the waiting room. I'll never forget this. And my phone rang. I'm in, I'm rang. I'm in the waiting room of location number five, and I recognize the my the uh, the name and the ID. I recognize, but I don't recognize the name. My phone knows this person. They're obviously my contacts. I answer the phone, and after a quick refresher of who he was, I met him at a. I'm a. I'm a lifelong networker and lifelong education a person like like everybody else and and go abundance I'm sure yeah. right uh, so I had I had been a part of a multi auto repair shop owners mastermind group for a couple of years a couple of years before that and I met him there and at the time I met him he had seven locations he scaled the nine locations and he uh, stayed on with the private equity form that that sold that he sold his stores to. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so he was leveraging his network and his phone. I was in his phone and he said, Hey man, are you, after we had some, uh, some brief, um, uh, some, uh, Pleasantry. Some pleasantry, so to speak. Yeah. I just said, hey, I said, uh, he says, are you interested in selling? And I just started laughing out loud because I was standing in the waiting room of a store I bought two weeks before. Yeah. Uh, and he says, I says, hey, man, and I told him that. And he says, we can work with that. And six months later, I sold all my stores to them. It was a, that, it was a that nice was the plan. So you said you were trying to get the 10 million. Was it from the beginning? Like, look, I'm going to build up to a certain size and then exit to private equity or did that plan reveal itself along the way and then you thought okay now i can see how to how i can exit i'm going to get the 10 million like was the plan originally for you to for you to build to a size to to sell or did that kind of come later that was on my goal sheet in 2017 as i re-reviewed my goal sheets 2017 2018 prepare to sell prepare to sell get to 10 million get to 10 million so yes that was in my goals um, um, and, you know, it, they gave us the multiple. I, that was our caveat to selling at the stage we were. We didn't want to take a hit for not having been at the 10 million. So now the challenge is this. How much is an auto repair shop worth that you just purchased with that you purchased it as a dog, knowing what its capabilities were from a tired seller? Now we have to negotiate what that value is and how we put a how we put a seven multiple on a number that doesn't exist. So we did agree. I thought it could do X number of dollars. They thought it could do half of that. We met in the middle mm -hmm. and uh, and came up with a multiple on that number. And then I had to prove while we were in escrow for five months, uh, one fifth each month of that number. And I did. 
Interesting. So you stay. So I was going to ask about staying on. So you stayed on long enough to prove the multiple, essentially. Just just during escrow. They did not ask me to stay on as a consultant. They did not ask me to uh, to do anything uh, you know, uh, creative for the sale. It was a cash deal and I didn't offer to stay. It was a beautiful thing. Good for you. So now you got yeah. a bunch of cash coming in from selling these businesses. The tax man cometh. Is this where you go to multifamily? <laughs> no, you know, it's funny. Uh, we'd have to back up to 2007 when I got in real estate, when I had just one auto repair shop. I, 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 our business was doing well. It was in the business world of uh, small businesses. It was stacking cash, Jamie. It was doing very well. I wanted to be a good steward of God's money. I had always wanted to be in real estate. I go into deep in the, I go deep into this story in my book, but I will just stay at the 30,000 foot level. I want, I knew I needed education in the real estate world. I, I signed up with Wealth Intelligence Academy, which at the name, at the time had the, uh, had the face of Robert Kiyosaki on it. And uh, I spent $27,000 in their education with classes, everything from probate to wholesaling to rehabbing to you know, you name it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we started our house flipping business in, a, in conjunction with our first auto repair store. And we were flipping uh, houses and doing wholesale deals. And a couple of years later, uh, we were inducted into that school's Hall of Fame, which just just means that you're doing something with the education. That's you know, that I, trophy, trophies gain dust. You know, show me the paychecks. We, we were doing you with Kiyosaki in the photo where you're inducted. That, into the that's school. exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. So that was fun. It was good to good photo op. Good for the resume. My wife says I no longer need a resume, but I still say that. But <laughs> anyways, it looks good on a Facebook post, right? <laughs> it, does. it does for sure. Now, at, in 2009, at the Hall of Fame induction ceremony was a guy jumping around the stage that was from Boston. His name was Dave Lindahl, and he heads a company called RE Mentor. And I just got excited about taking our real estate education to the next level. And I bought his course uh, in 2009 to learn how to do multifamily. And, you know, just like a lot of other people, I'm no different, you know, by spending another 27 grand by pure coincidence, that's how much his course was. My mind could only couldn't go from single family to hundred unit complexes. It went to four plexes <laughs> and six plexes and 12 plexes. And that's what we started flipping and acquiring in San Diego, which is where our base was at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that was, that was the next level up, you know, like we were talking about before we started recording, we can only handle so much. If God told, if you, God somehow revealed to us everything we needed to know to get from A to Z, we wouldn't even begin the journey, right? So I just began the process and my mentor, my local mentor in my real estate investment um, uh, association meeting <clears throat> said, Rob, your goal should be, I know you're using hard money, you're using some of your own cash to flip these houses, but your goal should be the profits from the first two or three or four should buy the fifth and you should buy it cash, renovate it and keep it because holding real estate is long-term wealth. And I saw the wisdom in that. And we started doing a lot of that. So every third or fourth or fifth condo, single family home, fourplex, sixplex, we kept and kept as a rental in San Diego. And, you know, back when we started, you got to keep in mind, a lot of people don't realize when I was flipping houses, they're not, you know, I, I, I sometimes joke and say, you know, back then real estate was a dirty word. But when I was flipping houses, and there's a lot of house flippers that may hear this, when we were underwriting the house flip, the after repair value, we were underwriting at 10% less than it was the day we were buying, because that's how much the market was still going down. Sure. sure. So if it was worth 200 right now, it was going to be worth 180, 90 days from now when I was done with the flip. And that's how we were underwriting. A lot of people, a lot of people have amnesia, don't remember those days. But yeah. what happened in keeping those rentals is equity happened, right? I lived in San Diego. San Diego has phenomenal equity, like the whole country seems to have nowadays. Yeah. But back then it was just yeah. San Diego, right? Yeah. Uh, Ohio has great equity increase right now. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter, I, you know. To that point, I, people always say I, it's almost like it's almost funny to hear because everyone will say, "Oh, well, this market's just been hot." It's like I mean, you could just put anything there: Peoria, Illinois, uh, <laughs> right? You know, Los Angeles, California, you know, whatever. You know, yeah, Fort, Fort crazy. Texas, it's all the same. Everyone's doing absolutely, great yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so. 
I was sitting with a wealth, um, a wealth advisor, and by the way, everybody should have a, some sort of a wealth advisor at one level or another on their power team who looked at my portfolio, looked at my, my list of real estate assets and says, hey, you know, your cash flow is decent. I would expect only decent out of San Diego because it's not a cash flowing state when you, um, you know, a place to purchase uh, rentals. He says, but your return on equity over this time since you purchased it from 2009, 2010, 11, 12 till now, your return on equity is 0.0001%, Rob. You're sitting, and you can't eat equity. You need to turn that equity into cash flow. And I got to looking at it and I realized he was right. And we started doing some 1031s out of San Diego into other places in the country. Our real estate education had taught us how to do evaluations of local markets, you know, what the population, what the job growth was, and so on and so forth. And so we started taking a fourplex and putting it with the 12 plex and trading it for a 70 plex and a 96 plex over in different parts of the country. And, uh, you know, because, and we did a lot of that. Yeah. Um, we're combining different properties into one 1031 and it's a it's a part-time job if you've never done that i gotta tell you it's a it's a bit of a job and it's uh it's a little little it's it's a little stacks a little bit lower on the things i want to do uh than a root canal quite frankly but 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 we got it done it was a lot of work it took two years yeah. to get all those properties flipped over into other states but uh and, uh, you know, now with all that equity now is what supports us. We don't need the bag of money we received from the sale of the auto repair shops, although we want the bag of money we got from the auto repair shops. We don't need that to live. But the education we got along the way has taught us how to uh, intelligently deploy that capital. When you sold the shops, did the real estate go with it? Or did you even own the real estate or were you leasing space? That's a great question. So in our in our space, the auto repair space, you don't need to own the real estate to create wealth. Four of the locations were rentals, and one of them was kind of a unicorn for um, for San Diego real estate. It's very difficult to buy an auto repair shop and make it pencil out for mm -hmm. cash flow. Uh, but one of them came to me and had completely um, had completely. Uh, deteriorated the uh, the value that he thought the auto repair shop was worth and just threw it in with the real estate. So I bought the shop and the business all as one. So yeah. we kept one of them and still have it. Uh, the, it's the only piece of real estate I have as income in California. Now my buyer is my tenant. Yeah. Triple net essentially at this point, right? Triple net. That's exactly Unreal. what it is. Unreal. Real quick too, uh, Dave Lindahl, that program, and maybe I'm misremembering or, or I'm making this up, but were you not inducted into a Hall of Fame in that program or something <laughs> similar? I was. And you know that? Thank you for that. It, it, um, I'm not an overnight success in Dave Lindahl's world. It took because I was because remember, my mind only expanded to four plexes and six plexes from right, that right. from that school. Uh, it was 2018 that we were actually recognized as uh, as hall of fame inductees and we're on the wall of fame in their office up there but you know once again we take that all with a grain of salt we're humble people uh, trophies get dust what really matters with all that is that's a pat on the back for having done something with the education right? that's it and that's the part man i do this this content now i talk about it i, I have this buzz phrase i use called be the testimonial like hey if you're going to join a course a program a education a mastermind go bonus whatever it is right like aspire to be the testimonial i love aspire that to be the, right well, that's from you. That's from you. No, no, no kidding. No bullshit. Like when we met, I forget where you told me this. And then I, I this was further reinforced when you did that ascend call so graciously uh, for us, where you went in and really taught about your, your story and everything. We're going to get deeper into it here in a moment. But that was like, man, like, yeah. And I think about for me, and not intentionally, and I don't think for you either, coming into a go abundance, like now I host the podcast. I partnered with, you know, David and the other elders on, on the Emergent Ascend program. I met Mark Henteman and, you know, became a partner with him with Quantum Capital. And I, I'm, I'm able to be, I don't know, known in this world of millionaires. So for me, that is being the testimonial. I didn't set out to be the, but I think that's a great thing to aspire to. And to be honest with you, very honest, no BS, hand to God. It was from you that that came because you went, wow. you were, I, I believe there was even a, th I, I might be thinking, I feel like there was a third program or a third group that you joined where you went that far and were like nationally recognized in some way. But I know at least Lindahl and Kiyosaki were Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, you were Hall of Fame entrance in their programs, which I didn't even know a lot of these places had Halls of Fame. So. <laughs> right. Most people so, don't because quite frankly, quite frankly, it's not that big of a deal. The key thing is, are you getting right. checks, right? Are you making That's money fair. with your education investment? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, exactly. You're, and I love the phrase. It's an investment. Back in what, 2007, 27 grand. I mean, that's, that's a lot now, but that's a ton then, right? So I mean, it's a lot a of money for us. Investment, sure. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Wow. 
All right, getting into the auto industry, uh, uh, you know, it has deep roots, but you know, like the the path there. So take us back. I mean, addicted to life, you know, the implication there, obviously, around around uh, addiction. Uh, you have a deep story on this, so if you don't mind, kind of giving us a, a backstory on how did you go from, uh, it, you know, how did you eventually get to the auto body industry and the story that leads us up? Yeah, there. you bet. So uh, for those that don't know my story, I was living on the streets homeless in 1999. I'm a recovered crystal meth, crack, cocaine addict, alcoholic, recovered, recovered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have to give him the credit before men so that he recognizes me before his father someday. So that's very important that I say that. Um, but uh, by the grace of God, I stumbled into a rehab in 1999, and I have not picked up a drink or a drug since. I built a very, very strong foundation of recovery that I encourage people that I sponsor into the world of recovery uh, re uh, nowadays um, with meetings and, and accountability and, uh, and reading the book of AA and just learning about my disease and becoming aware of what my real problems were. And once I got sober, things changed. You know, my father didn't want me around. <laughs> Neither my family didn't want me around. They had kind of written me off as hopeless. But what happened is somewhere around by the time I got to five years sober, my father saw the changes in me. He saw I was running somebody else's auto repair shop. By the grace of God, another auto repair shop owner took me under his wing and taught me by his example how to run an ethical, honest auto repair shop. And that was the last job I ever had. I worked for him for five years. And during that five years before, and that was in Phoenix, Arizona, my stomping grounds where I wrote my story. My father, I would come over and my father, eventually my parents would allow my wife and I to visit. Um, they saw the changes in us. And my father and I were on a drive. We went to breakfast one day and he would tell me the story of a friend of his that owned an auto repair shop that every time he went there, it was, it was, it was more of an associate than a friend, but every time he went there, his exit strategy was one of his five sons would take and buy his auto repair shop and he would own the building and they would rent from him. But one at a time, they all showed that they did not want to be a part of auto repair. Mm -hmm. And the one that was still there was not the guy to run, run a business. So he was bleeding to my father on his shoulder. Hey, the, my, my business is losing money. My business is losing money. My father told, when my father told me that story, Jamie, I said, tell him your son does this and tell him that he's interested in buying his auto repair shop should he ever be ready. Well, three years later, I was uh, it was where I was roughly uh, five years clean. My fa my phone rang. It was my father. And he said, Sterling's ready. And I said, who is Sterling? Because I I didn't even know what he was talking about. Right. He said, Sterling, the owner of that auto repair shop we drive by all the time, he's ready to sell. And within a few days, um, now the caveat, now we're talking December the 1st of, nine, of uh, 2003. And the caveat was they wanted to close this deal by, by, by December 31st. We had one month to make a decision. Here I am, you know, put yourself in this position because a lot of people, I, I look back at it now and I think, man, this is crazy. But we had just purchased our first home. There was a prepayment penalty, which was $12,000, which should have been a million based upon my economic standings back in those days. There was no way I could pay that $12,000 prepayment. So it meant I would have had to rent out my house, move all my, put all my stuff in a moving van and come and uh, stay at my sister's house because she graciously offered and, uh, and just burn out and, and leave my, my, my safe, secure place of employment. And, uh, and my father, and, and so I flew out there no matter what, and just to check out the details, didn't really even know what he wanted for a price. So check, check out the ignorance that goes on here. You know, I was just excited. I didn't know what he wanted for a price, didn't know if he would, uh, what terms he wanted. I had no idea how we were going to buy this business. And uh, we ended up negotiating the deal. He wanted $150,000 for the business. He would carry $100,000, $150,000 down. My father loaned me the $50,000, and it was basically a no money down deal for my wife and I. Yeah, you know, I love that. And 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 the point you made just now, you had no idea how, but you knew that you would, right? I think that's that you were committed to figuring it out, and you did it with zero money out of your pocket, zero money, and that eventually led to you know, $10 million in revenue and an exit at a seven multiple or whatever you ended up getting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that decision led to Absolutely. There, which is amazing, amazing. And it's it's incredible for a guy to take you under his wing, especially the condition in the beginning that you were in. I mean, look, oh, I'm going to pull these up here in a second. If you don't, if you don't mind, I'm going to pull up some. Not at all, up. man. Not yeah, at all. But, but go back a minute here. How long were you in the throes of a day? I mean, I know you're, you're in recovery. I mean, it, like when you were using, what was the period in which you were using? 
You know, my spiral, that's a great question. So I started, unfortunately, at the age of 11, my parents divorced when I was six years old. And at the age, I didn't really have or allow, I had some, but didn't allow much um, uh, male positive influences in my life. Because my mom was a hardworking uh, single parent, I had a lot of freedom. And I abused that freedom by hanging around with the wrong crowd. And we've all heard it. We become exactly what we hang around. It's cha cha chapter seven in my book is, 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 uh, is called The Law of Exposure. The law of exposure says that you are what you are, what you uh, you are, what you hang around, whatever you hang around, you will become. Right. So I was hanging around with bad people and the people were smoking weed and drinking Boone's Farm apple wine down at the railroad tracks on weekends. And that's that's how my drinking and drugging started. And fast forward all the way up until the age of uh, 33. And I was in a I was in a spiral downward. Um, I was in a spiral uh, downward spiral that was just totally accelerated with the introduction of crack cocaine, because I was a slow spiral, but it was going down when I was doing uh, crystal meth. Uh, but uh, as soon as I introduced crack cocaine, it it was over. I was in and uh, I was in jail more than I was out of jail. I was fired from uh, so many jobs that I had to. Uh, <laughs> that yeah, yeah, that's cool. The, the mug shot. No, no, I'm I'm pulling this up that. for people watching on YouTube. I mean, I, mean, I love that. This is and we're talking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mug shots, eight arrests, or were there more? Oh, there's a lot more. Those are those are the eight that I use for the uh, for the for the, each chapter of the book. Since there was only <laughs> since there was only eight chapters, I I just chose eight of the mug shots. But there was there was a lot of them because you know by the time I by the time the spiral was coming to the end and I walked into that rehab, Jamie, I was you I know mean, I I was shoplifting and doing fraudulent schemes and doing petty theft to support my drug habit. I was walking into uh, Walmart with uh, with a bag in my pocket going right up to this cartons of cigarettes and loading up 20 cartons of cigarettes and walking right back out setting off the beeper indicators and and just walking to my car like I didn't even hear them that's and I was getting tackled by loss prevention at Walmart and Home Depot and Target all over the metropolitan Phoenix area uh, so I was in jail more than I was out of jail and I had two probation officers and literally 13 or 14 warrants out for my arrest for failures to appear when I walked into that rehab that day. Were you aware feeling this was, I mean, it was, it, it, I can't, was there a duality to this for you? So, you know, in, in the physical form, you're, I'm guessing strung out, you're high, you know, you're, you're just, like you said, you walk in almost numb, grab the stuff, walk out, don't really give a shit. But, <laughs> but internally, it, could you feel, was it like, like building this, this isn't me. What are you doing? Was that happening or were you just completely sort of numb to it? Almost almost like in a sociopathic mode. That's that a great way. question, Jamie. So you're always you always have great questions, man, just so you know. But that <laughs> is a great question. Curiosity runs <clears throat> wild on this stuff, you know? <laughs> And the reality is there were moments of what you just described, but they moments were uh, so they, like sociopathic almost like doesn't no, happen. no, no, no. There were moments of clarity where you clarity. realized you in in a hotel room when I was a when I was alone, tears flowing down my cheeks. What am I doing to my family? What am I? Why haven't I seen my children in so long? What am I doing to my wife? Uh, why am I doing? There were moments of that. The rest of it was complete numbness because you had to shut that off in order to survive. How did you, was there a point at which, I mean, you're in California, I, you're at three strikes and all this stuff. Like, was there a point at which you were, you were facing maybe a, an extended sentence? That's a great question. So actually I was in the Phoenix metropolitan area writing this story. I only moved to San Diego oh, oh, oh. for the purchase of the auto repair shop we just spoke about. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Got it. Got it. What, um, what was the breakthrough? What was the moment? What was the epiphany? What, what, what changed it? Oh man. You know, I was still running and gunning, doing dope, and uh, and you know living on the streets uh, at hotel rooms and doing the things that drug addicts do. And I was at at one probation officer for driving under the influence of crystal meth, and I had a new probation officer, quite frankly, for um, for domestic violence because I'm not a real good guy when I do dope. Yeah. And I was sitting at, at I and I tell this story in my book, but I had missed two of the appointments. And I had to get to this appointment no matter what. I'm sitting there, filled. they give you an intake packet that's an inch thick that asks you about your drug history. It asks you about your work history. And really, 
it's an opportunity to get completely transparent or not. You mm -hmm. could lie on it, right? Like I had done so many times before. So I knew as I started reading the questions on this, that I needed to make a decision. I needed to get real or I needed to lie like I'd always done, which would have bought me a little bit of time. But quite frankly, I would have ended up doing the two years that the, had been set aside for the probation because eventually I was going to test dirty. Mm. So I decided I made this decision back to your question. What was the turning point? It was right here where I decided that I was done, which, by the way, that story is in chapter one of my book. And that's the name of chapter one. You got to be done for any change to happen in your life that's, that means anything. You've got to be done with the old life, the old behavior, the old habits so bad that the pain to change is less than the pain to remain the same. You know, the pain to remain the same was so painful for me that I knew that the pain to change would be less for me. So I filled out that that income uh, documents with complete and rigorous honesty, right down to the fact that the crack pipe was still warm in my pocket, Jamie. Knowing that she could have come in, you know, taken the packet like she did, went to her office to review it and came back and said, you know, we're going to revoke your probation. Wow. She didn't. By the grace of God, she invited me into her office and she said very sarcastically, well, I guess we don't need to do a drug test now, do we, Mr. Roselle? Yeah. And uh, she says, look, you look like walking death. I'm not playing games. If you're not serious, tell me now. Let's just set the probation aside and get you due to the time or I can help you. What's mm -hmm. it going to be? And I asked and I told her flat out, I'm done. I am done. She believed you, right? In that she moment. did. So that came out of you. It wasn't just like the you're saying it for the sake of saying it. She could sense it. I was done. And yeah. she 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 believed me. Well, let's put it this way. You know, <laughs> in that in 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 that in, in that role that she plays, how many people tell her that uh that they're done and just right, don't right. and they point, mean right? they, they they mean it, but they don't really do anything, right? So I I'm probably one of the very few that actually did what they said they were gonna do. No doubt, man. That's so all right. So you 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 wrap up. I want to ask about your, your wife here in a moment, but there was a question that popped into my head that just popped back out and I'm sure I'll come to it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I remember what it is now. So you, you were saying about, um, about uh, uh, when your, your pain exceeds the, the pain, the pain to not continue exceeds the pain to continue or, or, or something like Correct. that. Correct. Like, no, that's exactly right. You hit a pain threshold and you stop and that, that could be applied to almost anybody at various degrees. Yours is extreme, obviously, right? You're, you're multiple times, arrested you're in the throes of an addiction and you said i'm done right it was the pain the pain in that moment but for some people it might be do i quit my job or do i leave this relationship or whatever it might be do you do you have a sense now with your experience is it possible to achieve that pain point at any point that you want to or does it have to come when it's going to come does that make sense like people want to quit their job today but they don't and I think they were like, man, I wish I had that pain point where I could quit my job right now, but I don't know. I don't know how to make it happen. Can it, do you think, or is it just God's will when it's going to happen, it's going to happen. You just have to, you know, to that's a great question. And, and, and Rob's opinion only yeah, here, right. I can only yeah. answer in my opinion, everybody's threshold for that pain is different, right? Some people, some people will listen to the doctor that says you really need to lose some weight. And some people are going to have a heart attack before it happens. Some people are going to have diabetes before it happens. Some people are just are going to have to replace a knee before it happens. Right. We all, we all, and that's a great example because our health is an easy one that yeah. it's, it's slow progression to get where we want and it's slow progression to get where we don't want to be right yeah. by doing the wrong thing over and over you know you can eat mcdonald's nothing but mcdonald's for 30 days and not see any ill effects right yeah. but but try that for nine months <laughs> right yeah. but we can also eat healthy for 30 days and not see a ton of great effects try that for nine months right yeah. so that 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 light switch is going to I think click for all of us differently and that level of pain that it takes for us to actually initiate some positive change in our life is going to be different for all of us as well. You know, I've, I've, I've yo-yoed on the health thing. For those that don't know, this is in my book as well. I lost 70 pounds. Um, I mean, because when I got sober, I need, <laughs> I needed to gain 30 pounds. I was a walking skeleton, but I gained a hundred pounds. Uh, so uh, because, you know, I had changed addictions. I didn't even realize that I went from drugs and alcohol to cigarettes and food. So I was smoking four packs a day and I was 70 pounds overweight. Looked like I was eight months pregnant walking around, uh, buying, buying larger shirts than I used to wear, of course, you know? So, um, so I was done with my health 
and I made a decision. My, everybody's story is going to be different. I went to Jenny Craig, and yeah. uh, you know, six six months later, I lost seventy pounds. I quit the cigarettes cold turkey. I haven't picked up a cigarette since two thousand two, and I've yo yoed around that seventy pounds. But now I don't need to gain seventy pounds to realize I'm off track. For me, it's five to ten nowadays. Thank right. God. Yeah, yeah, you're in the Jenny Craig Hall of Fame too. I'm sure. That's, uh, that's the story <laughs> yes. of you. Always, in, yeah. Always Results not typical. Results <laughs> not typical. <laughs> Unless you're Rob Rosa. That's um, funny. One of the through lines in your book, and just talking to you, that was really, really interesting to me and shocking, to be honest with you. I don't know the exact date. I, I didn't go back and look, but you were married. When did you get married? Uh, we got married in 2003. Okay. And when did you meet your wife? 1998. So your wife was with you through all of this. Like, Isn't it crazy? And she's still your wife. She's still my wife happen? today. <laughs> how did, did you say, how did that happen? How did that happen? Yeah. You know, yeah. What, what was it? How did you sustain a marriage through all of this? Uh, you know what? That's by the grace of God. And she is just, she is one incredible, one, one of a kind woman. And I am the luckiest man on the face of this earth to have her. I will tell you that um, <clears throat> my parents, her parents, everybody told her to run like hell. And the man that I was really needed to be ran away from. It was good advice for that person that no longer exists. That was the previous Rob Roselle. But she stuck it out. I will tell you, towards the end, uh, I was on the brink of losing her. I had pushed even her to the line. And that's one of the motivators that had me get honest and say that I was done. Because one of the things I didn't really go into is while I was sitting in that probation office, uh, trying to make a decision whether I filled out this uh, this information packet. Honestly, I sat there in tears and, and sobbing uncontrollably as I thought about the pain that I had put my wife through. Hmm. Yeah, I don't blame you. When they told your parents, especially, I <laughs> told her, run from this guy. I mean, her parents is one thing, but your parents said it. Did she ever articulate? I'm sure she has. Why did she stick around? What did she see? Was she an addict as well? Had she gone through that? Like, what, what was the... What you know, the, and I'm glad you said that because I want to make, make make sure to make the point. My wife has never used drugs. She does not drink. And she was just, she was addicted to Rob Rosell. What, what about you? Like, what was it? Did she ever tell you what she saw? No, no, she didn't. I don't have question it. She, she might figure it out and take off on me, Jamie. I'm, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you ever asked her? Have you ever asked, like, what, why did you stick with me through 99, you know, through, through that whole ordeal? Because... You know, like the other things that Rob Rosell does in his life, he's very good at talking his way out of messes, right? Or talking his, or getting himself around, surrounded by very good people, which I did in my, when I had my businesses and I do with my real estate team, because uh, I'm a good salesman, I guess you'd say. And I just continue to sell the fact that give me one more chance. Wow. And she did. I don't know. Your point. She and, had a and she did. Well. And she yeah. did. And I'll never forget, you know, and when you're in rehab, a lot of people that have been through rehab may relate to this because it's not uncommon to do something called a hot seat. And that about two weeks into your 30 days, you sit in the chair, everybody takes a turn at this day, everybody gets their day at some point in rehab, and everybody in the rehab that has had two, I think it's about three weeks, actually, they've had two to three weeks to get to know you. And then they go around the room and they tell you all the good and your, your, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your leader writes down the positives and writes down the negatives, the things you need to work on. And then one of the people that was in the, that is allowed to be in the audience was my wife. Mm. And my wife says, well, what do you, what do you, um, forgive me for that. No, okay. What do you, what do you want or what is missing that Rob could provide to you. And I'll never forget this. My wife loves to cook. It's a passion of hers, right? And she burst into tears and she said, I want a kitchen. That's what I want. I want a kitchen to call my own. And I'm happy to say my wife has a few kitchens now. Yeah. yeah. So she's she's reaping the faith, she's reaping the rewards of her faith nowadays. And it, it just it just, it just lights my heart on fire to watch her enjoy the fruits of all the hard work that both her and I have done to get to the point that we're at now, Jamie. Do, do you have any, um, are there any moments of weakness? Any, I mean, maybe not as much now, but along the way where you came close, maybe to relapsing or, or using again or anything like that? Or have you been, was there a conversion and you've been in, in recovery and fully committed to it since? 
That's a great question because certainly there's been a lot of people in situations that have tested me and yeah. test me even today for that matter. Although I, although I must say my, I live a pretty drama free life nowadays compared to when I had 47 employees, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. no, the answer to your question is no. Because I've always, one of the things my my early on sponsor taught me was, Rob, play the tape all the way through. You go, you get high, then what? And as I play that tape all the way through, and I see all the ground that I've gained and all the blessings the Lord has put into my life, I don't want to lose even one of those. Mm. Not to mention, because it all starts with your self-respect is the first thing you're going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. How active are you in recovery today? I mean, do you attend meetings? Is that what, I mean, do you have to do that still at this point? I mean, it's what, 20 some years in or, or are you pretty feeling pretty, you know, transformed, if you will, recovered? I, you know, I, I'm recovered. Although if you talk to a lot of AA, lifetime AA guys that we talk about always being in recovery, I will never be re- recovered. I don't fully subscribe to that. I think, yeah. I think the Lord took care of that. Quite frankly, Jesus Christ took that out of my life. I still, uh, but but step twelve is about helping the new addict, right? So so I do, and that's what that's what participates in our own recovery, building that foundation I talked about previously. So I do attend a group called Celebrate Recovery. It is it is a Christ centered twelve step recovery that's national, started by. Um, started by an attendee of Saddleback Church from Rick Warren. Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. A lot of people are familiar with that. It's a popular yeah. book, 35 million copies sold worldwide, not 100 bad. languages. Oh, it's an amazing book. What'd you say? I said not bad, 35 million copies. Oh my gosh. Almost yeah, this, as many as you. Almost. Yeah, as many. almost, almost. Okay. Talk about a book that changed my life. There it is. Hmm. Purpose Driven Life. It's a it's a 40 chapter 42 he's upgraded to chapter 42 chapters you do a chapter a day and uh, really really opens it's really what it is it, it, it really enlightened me to what it means to be a christian right as a christian we have five purposes worship fellowship discipleship ministry and missions and each section of the book all 42 chapters breaks down each one of those purposes and it really helped me understand the importance of being here and what i'm what first <laughs> the first sentence in the book is it's not about you because we're not put on this earth to, to please ourselves we're here to make a significant impact on this world Along the way, somewhere you you became uh, uh, well. Being Christian, you're you're passionate about contribution, time, money, tithing, all of that. When did that become? I don't know. Almost habitual for you was that like when you made the conversion and you started making a little bit of money? Were you automatically tithing? Is that something more recent? I'm just kind of curious where contribution became a part of your life because what I know of you is as you've dug, dug further and further into your faith, as you as you become more and more devout. I say no, what I think I know about you, more and more devout, the more and more abundance uh, that has come into your life, you know, from, both from a relational standpoint, your health, your wealth, all of that stuff. So when did contribution become a central part? And what does that look like for you today? You know, as one of the basics as a Christian, as we start to mature as a Christian is, is tithing is, yeah. is a very form, uh, formal word that most people know about. And that's 10%, right? And the, the 10% is that pays the pastor's salary. If you have a mortgage at your church, which many do, that pays the mortgage, pays the light bill, pays the expenses mm-hmm. that are month to month reoccurring expenses at a church. So it relies upon that. <clears throat> and it relies on the people that attend that place of worship to be able to support them on a regular basis so they can reach out in the community and do different events, do different kids uh, thing, uh, events for kids and kids camp during the summer. So <clears throat> I've known for a long time that the 10%, even before I started doing it, but to be completely transparent with you, we did it when it hurt. Mm-hmm. We, we did it when I was, when we were still coming up in those five years that I worked for Richard as an, at an auto repair shop, I went to my wife and I will tell you, it's a little bit of transparency. I haven't shared with a ton of people, Jamie, but my wife and I, we weren't yoked alike uh, spiritually or religiously. If there is a word, my wife and I grew up in different religions. So for me to go to her, if it's like this big hurdle Satan had put between me and her uh, in my own mind, that yeah. I was going to go to my wife and tell her that my, my, my belief is that we're supposed to give 10%. And so I him and hawed and procrastinated and didn't really do anything about it for a little while. It's probably about three to six months. And when I finally went to her and I shared with her what my Christian beliefs were, without a hesitation, she said, okay, I'm fine with that. 
It was just this wall that I had built in my own head. So the Lord just totally opened that door. We've done that for a long time. But 10%, like I said, that's basics. So we know we go, that's 101. 202 is, you know, we, this, there's a phrase in most churches, the ones that I attend, tithes and offerings. Tithes is the basics. Offerings is the Holy Spirit may tug in my heartstrings and say, that person that I know is going through a hard time, I need to help them. That's offerings, right? Or, hey, we got four kids that, you know, we're taking 20 kids to youth camp and four of them don't have the funds. Who would like to sponsor a child? If the Holy Spirit tugs your heartstrings and says, hey, I want to sponsor that child, that doesn't come from tithes because we still need to pay the pastor and the light bill, right? That's offerings above and beyond the tithe. So again, that's 202. And for the people that are high net worth individuals that have high annual incomes, this should be second nature. This should be, uh, honestly, uh, the people that I talk to anyways that, that are at this level, quite honestly, they don't even think about that because the Lord, it's one of the things that the Lord said to test him on. In fact, it's the only thing that he talks about in Malachi, he says that if you give your first ten percent, the first, the best of your crops, the best of your of your uh, of your animals, then I will fill your barns to overflowing. And you know, I've lived it. Yeah, I've lived it. He he, you know, you I you can't outgive God is the way it was put to me, and I've that. lived it. You can't outgive God. That might be the episode title. I like that. <laughs> you can't outgive. God. That's, <laughs> that, that, that's a, that's a great line, but that, that's such, such a good point. And I needed that reminder, right? I, I um, Money is such a uh, uh, an interesting, I don't know, tool. The, I heard this somewhere, I forget where, and I've applied it. Whenever I'm feeling bad about money, for whatever reason, you know, uh, it feels scarce or we're going through an economic shift or, or you know, whatever, a, a big expense popped up that I wasn't expecting or who knows, wife went on an Amazon, <laughs> whatever it is, right? <laughs> Whenever I'm feeling a little bit bad about money, um, the best anybody can ever feel about money is when they give it away, when they give it to somebody else, right? So in those moments when I'm feeling the worst about worst about money, it's an energy you're giving, I feel, this is my belief, it's an energy you're giving to that, right? You're giving away something to like money is controlling you to some extent. So that's the moment where I'm yeah. going to Starbucks and paying for the person behind me or doubling the tip uh, or doubling the, the, I'm sorry, paying 100% of the bill as a tip. So $120 bill, $120 tip at a restaurant, right? Like that Love sort that. of thing. Love Whatever that. it is to just like, you know what, I'm going to give it away. I'm just going to give give what I can away. But I don't I don't do it as systematically as I could. It's in chunks here, chunks there. I mean, it ends up at the end of the year looking good. I'm probably over 10%, I hope. Otherwise, Rob Rosell's coming to see me. That's but, right. I'm gonna, we're going to check. <laughs> that's right. But giving giving the money away is the best way to feel about money. So to your point, you know, if you give the best 10%, you know, it'll come back to you. I've found that even if you don't have a, if, if somebody doesn't have as deep a faith as you do in, in God and Jesus and in and, and Christianity, even if you don't, if you believe more in like the power of the universe, when you do give in that way, and when you put a good energy around money, it comes back. It really it comes does. back to you. And, you know, and the, the thing I love about GoBundance, it, is, it isn't just money, right? We're, we're, yeah. we're, it's also our time because really there's time, talent, testimony, and treasure, right? Those yeah. are the four things we should be giving back on. So I find it very important for us, uh, Claudia and I, we donate time at Homeless Ministries uh, in Phoenix, in San Diego, here in Las Vegas, wherever we are. Uh, we're involved, and I go down to Mexico and I help build houses down there. They make it very easy for us as a ministry down there in uh, Tijuana. Uh, I'm in Vegas and uh, San Diego, so it's very easy to travel down there. They've purchased all the materials. We just show up and we do the work. Uh, set a team of 70 from my church went down and built six houses in two days, believe it or not, Jamie. It's wow. amazing how quickly we can do it. And the Lord, again, tugging on my heartstrings, our goal for 2023, Claudia and I, is to take uh, a team of men, 70 to 100 men, down three times in 2023 to do just that. And the houses, amazingly enough, the houses cost 11500 fully furnished with bunk bed, master bed, um, refrigerator, kitchen set, and, and loaded with three months of non-perishable foods for the families. What, this is where again? This is in Tijuana, Mexico. Wow. wow. Yeah, the, the, group, the group that does it is called YWAM, Youth with a Mission. And that's YWAM. who- Can you spell that for me? YWAM. Yeah, YWAM. Uh, Y-W-A-M, Youth with a Mission. 
Oh, the letter Y, wham. Got it. Got yes. It. Yep. And we just go down and piggyback on, on, I try not to, and when it comes to ministry, I try not to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of very, very good ministries going on outside of the 10% tithe of my church that I find. And we get to discover some of those right within, um, right within GoBundance for that matter. You know, there's a lot of uh, charitable uh, uh, organizations that are presented at our events, as you know, and a lot of money has been re- re- raised for those. Uh, grand at one of them. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Right? Yeah, the four charities. Yeah. It's amazing. Right? Yeah. Just, so yeah. I try to come up alongside other ministries that are already going, whether it be a homeless ministry that's already established. And if I can help with treasure and time, we do. It's just like these houses that we're building. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. These people got it all figured out. If I can go down there and build a house in two days and bring some friends and do six of them in two days, why try to why, why try to better that? Just go down and support them. You're, uh, you you talk about vision in the book. You you articulate at some point this goal to run the Boston Marathon. <laughs> that was probably, when was this written? 2017, the book? No, Eight, no. 18 is when it came out. Written in 17, okay. yes. Okay, so you had, you had a pandemic in the middle of it, but talk to me about the Boston Marathon. I know you accomplished it. Uh, when was it? Give me kind of the story on that, if you don't mind. Well, the why, first thing- I'll the Boston s- Marathon all the way through? All right, great, great question. So the first thing I'll say is don't ever put something in writing in a book unless you're a hundred percent sold out to the fact that you're going to do it. Because the funny story with that is a, an associate who was a business associate that turned out to be a good friend. I sent a copy of the book to, he read it in one setting. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a, he should be in go abundance, right? <laughs> he read it in one setting and he calls me the next day and says, Hey, fantastic book, man. Love the book. But one question, how the Boston marathon go? And I went, Ooh, I haven't done the Boston marathon. This was in 2020. And, uh, the reason for the Boston Marathon is a mentor of mine we've already talked about, him, Dave Lindall. When he stood from the stage teaching, part, well, part of what he talk about is his experience. He lives in Boston. And so he had run the Boston Marathon a couple of times and he had inspired me to run half marathons. I never thought I would run full marathons, but I did put it in my book that that was a goal before I died. And uh, so funny story that goes with that is in 2020, um, it was run in October. So I started doing research for registering for 2022 after my friend called me out on it, of course. And uh, and I, so it was just run October. So it must be in October of 2022. What I didn't know was it was run in October because of COVID. It's usually in April, April. on Patriots April. Day. So it. I'm put. I, I'm I know that time is, and I didn't know that yet. I'm filling out applications. They say that it's full. So my friend David Lindahl says, "Hey, you can run for charities. Go on this website." And so I applied for a bunch of charities. And then I realized it's in April. It's just a few months away. And I'm getting a no, a no, a no. And I'm thinking, thank you, Jesus, that they're right. declining these, these <laughs> applications because I can't be ready. Well, the last application, the one that I had actually filled out first for the Special Olympics, said you're in. Mm. And that was in December. So it was like the first week of January. And I trained for it. I ran it on April 18th of this year, 2022. Yeah. And I ran it in um, four, four hours, 29 minutes and 28 seconds. And my grandfather ran the Boston Marathon. It's why it was the other inspiration that I had. And he ran it, Jamie, in his 70s. He ran it at 76 years old. And he, I, I couldn't find his time to save my life. Uh, before I ran it, but on the day I ran it, I had a full day of recovery. I yeah. did find his time. And you know, at 76 years old, he ran it in four hours and 28 minutes and 35 seconds. He beat this 56 year old by one minute. <laughs> Is that crazy? Good for him. Wow. That's an incredible story too. It was, it's so cool. And I know you, you donated quite a bit. In fact, you spoke to our Ascend group and um, uh, uh, offered up graciously copy of the book for a twenty dollars donation or time with you, and all of that went to the right. Boston Marathon bid, which was great. And thank you so much for that. Yeah, we did raise fifty thousand dollars for the Boston for the uh, Special Olympics. I think we'll probably get an invitation to come next year because of that, because uh, they only expected ten thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. So we did, we did really good. Yeah. Rob Rosell goes, he goes big. So <laughs> I want to make sure we tell that story because it tells a lot about vision and so on and so forth. So Rob, I appreciate you opening up. I'm going to end this with a card game question from the Go Abundance card deck. You might have to think about this one or maybe not. Maybe you know right off the top of your head. What inventions could the world have done without? Well, that tortured device we call the elliptical comes to mind. <laughs> no, just. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, just, just kidding. Just kidding. I don't know. Let's, um, I don't know. One, Probably the, uh, you know, some houses have it, the little thing that you pull out that has water right above the stove to put into the pot, I guess. That's kind of oh, a waste, oh, oh. A waste yeah. of plumbing and time. <laughs> what do they call that? A, a pot? pot faucet or something like that you, you know you got me but i would never use it because i don't cook so to me that's a waste of an invention <laughs> i don't know what i would say it would have to be something like uh like fashion wise like like bell bottoms you know like, I, I don't know that would be that's what comes to mind for me but you know. <laughs> we'll stick with elliptical that was a good answer. <laughs> good answer all right the book addicted to life rob you want to talk about where people can get this where they can learn more about you websites anything you want to share you know just go to my my website has it all uh, it's ro my name, Rob Rosell, R-O-W-S-E-L-L.com. And, uh, you know, with this, I've got a lot of free stuff there as well, you know, for different content that I've made over, over time, different meetings that I've sat in, the meetings like this, yeah. um, shared our story, talk about real estate, talk about health, we talk about wealth, we talk about a lot of different things. But yeah, visit the website, browse around. Most of what I do is ministry. I give out copies of books to people that are struggling, the people that are still coming up, people that are still going, still writing their own book, so to speak. So really the money is just to support the ministry. I love it. Mine for those on YouTube. Woo! I got mine, baby. I got mine signed. Thanks to uh thanks to you. So special. And, oh, and, I, and I I will say, not not to look reduce the value of yours being signed. I do sign every book. Every book I put a personal message in. So if you order the book, if if you order from Amazon, I don't have the luxury of doing that. But if you order it from my website, I do personalize every book for everybody. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna just pretend like mine is just the only right. one. Right. High value, high yeah, value. Corinthians first in there. Yeah, I'm 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 good to go. This is all high value stuff. So <laughs> Robin, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure connecting. Hope to see you at the next event, of course. And uh, thanks for coming on and doing this. Fantastic. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jamie.